Hello everyone, Professor Fiore back one more time. In this video, we're going to wrap up our series on passive components. We've already talked about capacitors, resistors, now we're going to talk about inductors. We tend not to use inductors as much as we use resistors and capacitors simply because the physical devices that we make are the least ideal of those three but we still do use them and they come in different sizes shapes different purposes uses and so forth so here's a small sampling of small sort of uh, pc board level inductors we have some um, molded inductors right here at first glance they look kind of like resistors there's a toroid over here sort of a donut shape um, we also have some ferrite cores. These are ferrite cores. And um, this core right here that you can see, and this one you can't see it, it's hidden, but um, this enhances, this increases the amount of inductance that we can get. Okay. Now, we also would have uh, small air core in, uh, inductors. They would look an awful lot like these two right here, the red and the green, except you wouldn't have a core. They're fairly small inductance values. You know, compared to these, you would typically use those in uh, maybe like uh, radio frequency tuning circuits, things like that. All right. So you can see that we have uh, both axial and radial leads. In other words, leads that come out of both ends, leads that come out of sort of one side. All right. And of course, surface mount inductors are also available. Uh, there's nothing really unique looking about them. You know, they look pretty much like any other passive. Um, surface mount, you know, resistor capacitor, basically just a little, you know, rectangular-ish kind of thing, all right? So they're not too interesting to see in that regard. But, um, you know, we, maybe we want to drill down into this and get a better idea of, you know, what is used where, so to speak. What are the important characteristics? So the first thing I'm going to say is that uh, inductor size, physical size, tends to give you a clue into how much inductance you have. High inductance values tend to be physically large. So you know, this assumes you're using the same core. So if I compare uh, ferrite core inductors, you know, one that's 100 millihenries is probably physically going to be larger than one that's only 1 millihenry. So that's unlike a resistor. Um, kind of like the way a cap works, right? A high value capacitance tends to be physically larger than a small uh, small value capacitor. All right, so, um, you know, the small ones you're going to use for, like I said, uh, RF tuning circuits and things like that. Uh, larger ones, you know, there are many other applications. Um, one that you're probably familiar with um, inside a loudspeaker, right? We use uh, uh, coils along with capacitors to create uh, crossover networks for loudspeakers, right? Okay. Now, the difference between a ferrite core and a, uh, an air core is that the ferrite will give you a higher inductance. However, and this is an important thing, however, there is the possibility of saturation. In other words, the current through it can be so high that we start to go nonlinear. The core saturates. It's kind of like, you know, like a semiconductor amplifier, a tube amplifier you know, reaching its, its output limit, its swing. It just can't go any further, so we get distortion. Air core, on the other hand, they tend to be virtually impossible to, to saturate. So, you know, something like a loudspeaker crossover, if you're really, really concerned about saturation and its high power, you might go that way. You know, there are other things you might do. For example, you might use a, a, an active crossover system um, in, a, in a very high output uh, loudspeaker system, like in, a, like in a PA or a studio monitor kind of system, all right? But in a, a good quality uh, home loudspeaker, you would find, hopefully you would find an air core. Now, as far as parameters outside of just the inductance, right, and its, and its accuracy, its tolerance, a particularly important characteristic is the Q of the coil, and that is the ratio of the reactance to the resistance. So in your study of inductors, 
you know, one of the very first things they pop out there is the practical reality of the coil and the coil's resistance, not just its inductance, but also its resistance. It's very, very important. And it's also important to know that that resistance is a function of frequency, which means that the Q, short for quality factor, is also frequency dependent. Key element. How high can Q be? Well, Q can be over 100 for a good quality inductor at the right frequency. Now, the thing you got to remember here is that where that Q maxes out is a function of the design of the inductor. And generally, the larger the inductor, the lower that sort of maximizing frequency is. The inductor itself, as I said, will most likely be used at lower frequencies. Right? A big value, right? a big inductance value is probably going to be used at lower frequencies. So that kind of makes sense, right? the way that kind of works together. All right, so... You know, what are we looking at in terms of, of uh, different types? Well, you might see, as far as really large inductors are concerned, you might see these things that kind of look like transformers. They're um, laminated iron ferrite core kind of things. And really, they just look like, if you didn't know any better, you'd just think it was a transformer, right? So um, very limited in terms of high frequency capability, but they are great for high power. So... You know, any kind of high power uh, application, you know, charging, high current charging, things like that, you're going to see those. Now, the molded, which I'll remind you, right, so these are the molded ones. These are kind of uh, you know, much smaller values. And, you know, as I always say, at first glance, you, you might think, oh, that's just a carbon composition resistor. It's not. <laughs> Don't ever try to replace them. Be careful. Um but these are sort of modest values. They're not very big values. So you would use these maybe in, in higher frequency filters, radio frequency work, things like that. Now the toroid, the donut shaped inductor, that shape, that toroid contains the magnetic field. So there's minimal coupling with the outside world. And you can get a relatively high inductance out of that in this nice small physical package, all right? The other one I want to uh, mention here is, is the air core, which you know range, ranges from very small ones, like I said, for RF work to very, very large ones. So I mentioned the home loudspeaker crossover network. An air core inductor for uh, that kind of application where you're talking you know hundreds of hertz, maybe a few kilohertz for a, a critical frequency, those things can be really big. I mean, at first glance, if you weren't aware, you would just think it's a big spool of magnet wire, and that's it. You know, you would just like, what's what's the spool of magnet wire doing in here? Well, it's an inductor, all right? You know, I mean, it might weigh a pound, okay? I mean, we're talking about something that's physically large, right? Probably pretty expensive, too. Um, but again, because it's air core, you don't really have to worry about saturation, all right. Okay. So as we did in the other videos, I do want to take a look at some models, right? Models of our inductors to kind of put a finer point on this. And once again, I'm going to use this little trick of having a current source drive our model. In this case, it's the idealization of, you know, pure inductance, 10 millihenries in this case. Put a voltage meter across it. So we're going to wind up plotting the output voltage over the input current, and of course, V over I is the impedance Z. In our case, that's going to be the X of L. So um, with this particular one at one kilohertz, 10 millihenries, you can calculate that, calculate that out, excuse me, it'd be 62.8 ohms. So I'm just going to come up here and grab our little Bode plot, AC transfer characteristic. Bring this up. And see what we get. Now, again, because this is a Bode plot, it wants to put the axis over here in decibels, and we're going to have to turn that back into logarithmic. All right, so we can see this is starting down here, you know, at about an ohm, and then working its way up, right? So we set it one, um, 1K, I think it was, All right? Yeah, at 1 kilohertz, we're looking at 62.8 ohms. So let's just verify that. 
1k is right about there there you go so 63 a little little over but we're a little over oh so yeah you can see it right we don't have infinite resolution here but that's right on the money so that looks good and we see this thing just climb 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 right as the frequency goes up exabel increases we can check out the phase response and basically it's 90 you know we're getting some little uh, glitches here probably just internal round off error people sometimes freak out when they use a, a, a simulator and they see weird things like this but don't forget what the axis over here is right i mean it's saying 90 90 90 90 probably because it's like 90.00001 90.00002 so really it's 90 degrees just be done with it all right always look at that you know i've seen students kind of freak out like oh my god what is this it's nothing don't worry about it all right anyway let's go look at um, a better model for our inductor so here we have the inductor and its coil resistance. So that's what I would call kind of a level one model that we often use. But a better one was, was to include a winding uh, capacitance, a parasitic capacitance that appears across the inductor. So I throw that in, and if you look at this, you realize, hey, you know, this is really sort of a, like a parallel resonant circuit. And you could approximate what that resonant frequency is with the 1 over 2 pi square root of LC formula. And with these values that I'm using, and this is not a particularly great uh, inductor for a 10 millihenry inductor. Um, these are not stellar values. They're not horrific, but they're not stellar. Uh, anyway, um, this works out to about 50 kilohertz. All right. But there is obviously going to be an interaction between these things. Right? If you recall looking at like impedance graphs for a uh, parallel resonance circuit, you know what I'm talking about. If not, we'll just do the Bode plot and see what we get. Bonk. All right. Once again, change the axis. Where are we? There we go. Logarithmic. Zoink. Okay, so you can see way down here, right? Here's the nice straight thing that we are expecting, right? Nice straight thing frequency goes up and the exabella goes up right down here it flattens down to 10 ohms because that's limited by our coil and if we just use that sort of first level approximation right that sort of one up from ideal this thing would come kind of come down here flat bend up and then it would just continue out forever but the winding capacitance at high frequencies takes over right it basically shunts this and what ends up happening is this thing starts dropping back off and you can see that very nicely in the phase response. So at very, very low frequencies where our coil dominates, you know, the circuit is resistive and the phase response is zero or very close to. As the inductance really takes over, this increases and we're up here at plus 90 as expected. We hit resonance and it goes to zero. And finally, at the higher frequencies where the cap takes over, this thing goes to minus 90 because the circuit's basically capacitive. All right, so that's the look of our inductor and the sharpness indicates the Q, right? Same Q that we're talking about in, in uh, resonant circuit analysis, right? How pointy is this? Now, when you're going to use this inductor, where do you use it in the frequency spectrum? Well, you don't want to use it way down here because it's really looking more like a resistor and you don't want to use it up here because it really looks more like a capacitor. Here's the range in which you want to use this thing. Right? That's the good part. So the manufacturer is going to give you some data. Right? They're going to tell you, for example, um, and well, they'll give you an impedance curve like this. They'll give you um, a Q curve. Right? We were talking about the Q, the quality factor. Um, that varies with frequency. So that might be another thing that we want to see. All right. So let's flip back. Just remember this shape. All right. So let's flip back. And we'll go and look at some data sheets. All right. So, you know, I pulled these from uh, TDK for a range of their uh, RF chokes. Choke is just the term for inductor because it, quote unquote, chokes off the current at high, at high frequencies. So you have the usual kinds of things that you would expect, you know, sort of measurement requirements, temperatures and so forth. Interesting stuff is over here. So here's the uh, inductance right, in microhenries, 1, 1.5, and so on and so forth. 
we work up to some fairly high values, millihenries, essentially. All right. And take a look at the Qs, right? 40, 50, 60, something like that. Um, they're giving you a frequency for that Q where they're, where they're testing it at, basically. All right. Um, the maximum resistance. And you can see as we get to bigger and bigger, I'll scroll this over here. Um, as we get to bigger and bigger inductors, that resistance is increasing, right? Over here, where I think we're at like 420. Down here, we're at, we're at a fraction of an ohm, right? Less than a tenth of an ohm. Now, we continue. And the manufacturer gives us some curves. This should look really familiar because we just looked at it, right? This, this is the impedance magnitude versus frequency. And you can see how these things are coming up. So here's a little one, uh, mi bleh, excuse me, one micro Henry inductor coming out here pretty high, whereas uh, the much larger 100,000 micro Henry's, in other words, 100 mil Henry's, that's peaking out at a much, much lower frequency. All right, 10 to the fifth, so it's 100 kilohertz. All right, there's megahertz and so on and so forth. So you can see these small ones are definitely going to be useful at much higher frequencies, these big ones. No way. It's not even going to look like an inductor. And then we can see what's happening with the inductor's Q. 100 right there. So some of these pop up pretty well, right? This, uh, this pair right here, we can see um, we're looking at some pretty impressive Q values on there. All right. Um, this one right here, that's the, the big one. That's the uh, 100, uh, 100 millihenry. And then uh, right next to it, here's the 10 millihenry peaking up there pretty nice. And then, you know, we have the 1 millihenry and on we go, right? So we get to the really high ones. Well, yeah, they're peaking at a higher frequency, which is appropriate because that's where we want to use it. Although it's not peaking quite as high. The Q isn't nearly as impressive. And the reason for that is, yeah, the, you know, the resistance is smaller, but the inductance is a lot smaller. So you're not going to see quite as high a Q. Still very good, though. All right. You know, if you can get a Q up to 100, that's doing pretty good. All right. Okay. So remember, Q coil, X of L over R coil. The Q of a circuit can't be any higher than that. If you have some kind of resonant circuit, that place, places an upper limit on the Q of the circuit, the Q of the system. Okay. So a bunch of different kind of inductors we might be using. Hopefully we've answered some, some of your questions where these things are going to be used, a more realistic sort of model for it, um, applications, things of this nature. I hope you've enjoyed it. And until next time, this is Professor Fiore saying, take care.